Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, a moving tribute and an accurate one with regard to Donald. I, I guess the one caveat that I would make is that in addition to his writings and the wonderful book that you edited with uh, Andres, um, one of the things that was most impressive about Donald in his last uh, year or two was his determination and his recognition that he would live on through others and the impact that he had would be something that would continue to be present through the lives of others. And I think that through the success of this Congress, uh, I see Ernesto uh, embodying many of um, the attributes that you discussed with regard to, to Donald in terms of trying to find a way to help us, help the children of this world and their parents find a better future for themselves. Uh, I guess the one point that I would just make before introducing uh, Leo is that um, in my encounter with Donald, one of the most powerful effects was somehow how he saw me rather than how I saw myself. He saw in me someone who could accomplish more and achieve more than I ever imagined when I first came to the Child Study Center many decades ago. And uh, I think it was also probably through his influence that I pursued my training in psychoanalysis and my own personal analyses. But I think that in, and I'm sure Andres may touch on some points of this with regard to training and mentorship, but that special relationship, not just between parents and their children, but mentors and the individuals that they come in contact with, and what they come to expect from them and how the individual responds to that expectation I think is something that we should all give careful thought to. It's actually quite sad that uh, Nate Lior will not be joining us today. Uh, Nate is a great friend, uh, a philosopher in his own right, has a PhD in philosophy as well as a published poet. He he is a man who has become world-renowned for his expertise on trauma and his devotion to uh, the community in which he lives to try and find a way to protect them as best he can from the difficult circumstances in which they're living. And um, I guess it's just unfortunate uh, because of his medical difficulties that he's not able to join us today. I uh, have met Leo on a number of occasions. Uh, he's someone who has worked very closely with Nate, has implemented some of the programs that uh, Nate and others have developed, and certainly has contributed in his own right a great deal to our understanding of trauma and how best to respond within the community to traumatic circumstances. And it's with great pleasure that I ask Leo to present uh, Nathaniel's presentation. As you may know, Nati was unable to attend this meeting and be here with you. A few days ago, he was writing an email to Ernesto and to the other friends uh, describing his situation, and I was next to him. I could sense the wide array of emotions inside him. We were preparing the lectures for this Congress, and he said, this one for the Donald Cohen Symposium, I will prepare, I will send you by email. I wanted to read it in my name. Nati wanted to be here, honoring all of you, Phyllis, Bob, Jim, Andres, Ernesto, all the friends, and particularly the memory of Donald, his great teacher, mentor, and real friend, who is so present in his daily work in each new project Nati develops. And believe me, there are many projects every year. I feel honored to have worked with Donald myself. I learned from his lessons that accompany me in my personal and professional life. I feel the honor of having been asked by Nati to present to you his lecture, which I'm sure was written with Nati's greatest mind, but also with his most loving heart. 
here is Nati Lawal's lecture. It is with great admiration and with awe that I undertake the task of reviewing, in this quite short time, Donald Cohen's legacy in the area of childhood trauma, on the theoretical, scientific, clinical, and social aspects of his work. It was my privilege to have been his student and hear him discussing these issues since the early 80s, first as a fellow at the Child Studies Center, then as a candidate at the Western New England Psychoanalytic Institute, and later on as co-researcher and collaborator directing the Tel Aviv Community Mental Health Center. Although I could not make the conference this time, I can imagine so many of you around the room, my colleagues and friends, and wish to share with you my indebtedness as it pertains to my work and the work of some of us to our beloved great late teacher. The question central to Donald's lifelong research, clinical and personal involvement was, what are the preconditions for the process of humanization in the context of social relationship? The area of trauma was one field among many within which he applied this central question as much as he had studied it in the other fields of his interest, from medical education, as he so aptly formulated it in his Sterling lecture, to the research with persons suffering of Tourette syndrome and autistic persons so beautifully described in his most sensitive research and clinical writing in those fields. And he had always considered his question in a multidimensional, integrative way, bringing to bear on the answers the various methodologies from different fields of knowledge, developmental psychology, social cognition, neurobiology, psychoanalysis, and even philosophy. Donald's interest in the vicissitudes of aggression within its individual and social matrix goes back to, to his early studies with children who suffered from chronically stifling illness and pain, those who find themselves locked up within their frames in need to mentalize and metabolize severe frustration, low self-esteem, punitive fantasies, sheer dependence on others without an outlet for activity but that of the creative mind. Donald was intrigued by such kids and saw in their plight but a cue for empathy and curiosity. Could they nonetheless turn into caring human beings? What would such development require of the social environment? Here he drew on Hans Lowell's ideas to formulate his observations about these children's experiences with others and the way this shaped the process of the transformation of aggressive motives and fantasies into more complex and adaptive ways of relating to the world. Lowell's theory places the origin of instinctual life in the social context of interaction, and Donald took this formulation very seriously when approaching the most affected and deprived children. He says, what a child comes to interpret as aggressive and let it pattern as assertive toward others is rooted in earliest interaction with others. This theory, Donald complemented with the following two others. First, the theory of mind. Between the ages of three to five, the child develops the capacity to evaluate the intents of other minds. And this developing capacity allows the child to contain contradictory mental states in a mature way thus laying the foundation for the emergent integrated character. And second, the theory of social institutions as regulatory of the developmental transformation of aggression. The child who is faced with moments of socially violent ruptures encounters institutions that must serve an empathic matrix to allow the transformation of instinctual and drive derivative manifestations. These are the family, the school, the clinic, as well as the neighborhood police. The importance of this approach cannot be better appreciated than against the background of the following statement taken as is from his paper with Linda Mays. When children are still evolving a sense of what is inner and outer, pretend and real, and what it means to hold aggressive wishes and feelings toward those they love and depend upon, early exposure to violence and deprivation shapes their view of themselves in relation to their own and others' aggressivity and their view of the world as hostile or protective, constructive or destructive, forgiving or punishing, loving or hating. 
This leads us directly to the formulation that comes to bridge the importance of attending to the outer world with an eye to integrating inner development. When Donald was moving to create with Steve Marans the New Haven CDCP, the Child Development Community Policing Program, such formulations were paramount. The potential trauma that follows the child's direct exposure to violence does not simply represent a shock that happens from outside. Its impact depends on the diverse personal meanings that a given external event may carry for children in terms of their own internal concerns, past experiences, and phase-specific development. Marens, Berkman, and Donald observed that when service providers operate in isolation in their attempts to address the multiple needs of children and families caught in the cycle of violence, they too may find themselves overwhelmed and immobilized. This applies to clinical staff as well as other child care takers, teachers, police officers, and others. And therefore, services must be integrated beyond the consulting room. And they continue. If mental health professionals are to play a broader role in these efforts, then clinical expertise and research must be increasingly applied to a range of services that extend beyond the consulting room. The 1991 Gulf War in Israel and Donald's intensive involvement with it sensitized him to the state of children living in the poorest and most violent neighborhoods in the U.S. He likened them to a war zone. He boldly defined the situation and raised the banner with the following battle cry to counteract the stifling arrest of child development and worse, the foreclosure of the future for children growing up in such neighborhoods. Here are the basic assumptions upon which the New Haven Child Development Community Policy Program was established in 1991. There was an inadequate social response to children at risk in violent neighborhoods from victim to assailants. There was a need for coordinated response from clinicians, police officers, welfare, churches, and juvenile justice systems. A process of transformational empowerment of police officers was required, a common child development language for assessing and responding to children exposed to violence. Mobilizing and accessing child mental health trauma specialists in conjunction with law enforcement officers in communities at risk is paramount. The need to exert substantial improvements in the children's sense of safety and experience of violence. Hundreds of children per year are seen in their neighborhood at scenes of domestic or street violence. Child clinical teams accompany police officers trained in child development and offer direct assistance, early diagnosis, intervention and referral for continuous care. The program operates 24 hours a day seven days a week. The model has been extended to other areas of intervention like the school system or school and drug abuse programs. By 1999, the pioneering efforts of the CDCP program led the U.S. Department of Justice to establish the National Center for Children Exposed to Violence at the Yale Child Study Center and declare a national program of training throughout the U.S. It has been replicated throughout the world best known program with Ernesto Caffo in Treviso, Italy. The latter integrates fully with Professor Caffo's nationwide Telefono Azzurro's focus on child abuse and his current Europe-wide initiative to enlarge the scope of this program. It is important to note that this program was actively involved in the post-9-11 public education, prevention and intervention in New York City and along the East Coast. It is also part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, now to be introduced. It was in that year, 2001, that the Donald Cohen National Child Traumatic Stress Network was endowed. This, too, was very much due to the collaboration of Donald Cohen and Bill Harris, as well as leading professionals in the field, particularly Robert Pinos, who is heading the network since then. This initiative was established to improve access to care, treatment, and services for children and adolescents exposed to traumatic events, and foster collaboration among providers through grants and professional committee work. 
this Yield of the National Network has been enormous in that it serves as an international model and resource on all levels of trauma work, research, theory development, intervention, and rehabilitation. Donald Cohen was a person involved internationally and carried his message concerning the importance of dealing with trauma throughout the international organizations he presided over, particularly Yakapap. Much of our collaboration with Ernesto Caffo in this regard we owe to him. But let us start from day one. It was 1991, during the SCAD missile attack, that Donald initiated support to a huge 3,000 people evacuation from the Tel Aviv area. In addition, he invited us to think about research, and with Robert Pino's support, he and Linda Mays helped us put together a research protocol relating to young children aged three to five. Six months after the war, we could conclude that displaced children and mothers showed higher externalizing and stress symptom levels compared to undisplaced or threatened subjects. Inadequ inadequate, that is too less or too much family cohesion predicted symptomatic reaction for three and four year old children, but not for older ones. These latter results persisted 30 months after the war, reflecting the fact that older children seem to be more autonomous than younger children in their attachment to their traumatized diet. Also, we could show that adaptive behavior may return to normal functioning given social and school rehabilitation, while post-traumatic symptoms persist 30 months following the trauma. The latter correlated positively with the mother's stress buffering capacity serving as protective matrix for their young children. We shared the interest in the attitude of post-traumatic children toward the other, defined as enemy as well as toward peace. In our last paper together, we examined such attitudes in the above-mentioned cohort of children who had been directly exposed to the SCAD missile attacks. Negative attitudes toward the enemy and a more pessimistic view on the probability of peace were positively correlated with behavioral modulation problems during the preschool years and with increase in post-traumatic stress and externalizing symptoms. Donald was extremely interested and supported both our Trauma and Disaster Intervention Center, named after him and Irving Harris, on September 11, 2001. During 1999, we collaborated with Yankee Yazgan, former student of Donald and Jim Lekman in Turkey, to create a full model of rehabilitation of an evacuation village following the 1999 earthquake in Turkey. We developed, among other programs, a teacher-based clinically informed intervention as part of the community reactivation program and were able to demonstrate a significant decrease in symptoms with the help of the teacher mediator. Irving Harris visited the project in Turkey and was presented with operational principles and outcome in Israel. The product of this intervention, which has been serving us in our collaboration with Ernesto Caffo, for example, after the earthquake in Molise, and to this, to this day in Israel, are the following. Mother-child group treatment for PTSD based on the concept of dyadic trauma. School teacher-based intervention based on the transformational empowerment model and the role of institutions as modifiers of violence and aggression in the process of child development. People-to-people -people commitment, based on the idea of mutual human guarantees and the siblinghood of humanity. The model was important to Israel to create the Tel Aviv Trauma and Disaster Intervention Center with the municipality, a resilience model that it is based on the above mentioned principles as well as on the following few other longitudinal les lessons learned from Donald Cohen's legacy. Transformational empowerment with teacher-based interventions, primary care, hospital, urban intervention teams, welfare-based trauma centers and research. We base our various approaches on the principle of empowering ecological mediators like teachers, nurses or army officers during routine times to take responsibility for clinically informed work during emergency. 
transformation of hate and aggressivity, the attitudes of children. For example, we are currently analyzing data on a large study to understand the roots of extreme political ideology on both sides, Jews and Arabs. Urban resilience, like the Arab Jewish Well Baby Clinics, a project in a mixed Jewish Arab neighborhood to facilitate early detection of developmental problems while at the same time empowering Arab professionals in the area of developmental psychopathology and trauma intervention. All this served us when we faced the Second Lebanon War. Within eight months, we were able to establish three preparedness and resilience centers in the north of Israel, one out of them for the Arab population. The list of Donald Cohen's direct and indirect impact in the area of child trauma would be incomplete without mentioning the work he got involved in 2000 with Mary Schwabstone to create an international program to study cross-cultural community violence, juvenile delinquency, and post-traumatic stress. This program, co-led by Vlad Brochkin and Robert Vermeeren, has yielded enormous scientific and socially relevant data. Also worth mentioning, is a recent related development led by Jim Lechman, initiated in with Ernesto Caffo, which includes Israeli and Palestinian child researchers, Editor, Empowerment and Resilience in Children Everywhere. This group is carrying forward Donald Cohen's legacy in the area of cross-cultural research in developmental psychopathology across conflict area borders. The Rome Group, a scientific stage for leading professionals in the area of trauma worldwide, which continue to collaborate significantly for this Congress as well, is another example of Donald's tradition of bringing people together to exchange ideas, discuss and create collaboratively. I can still see Donald going on a visit to Gaza in times it was a very unsafe area, encouraging the Palestinian trauma researcher Dr. Tabit. From Gaza, he went to the settlements of the West Bank, where our group eventually studied traumatized youth. He literally gave us a personal example, not only as bench researcher and teacher, but also as a socially committed human to alleviate the plight of children suffering everywhere and to the cause of peace. Let us cherish the vision of this great man and his intention. Help children thrive in safe and creative enough matrix allowing each and every child, everywhere, develop the capacity to contain contradictory mental states in a mature way, thus laying the foundation for the emergent integrated character and a peaceful world. For this, we honor him today and shall always remain grateful. Nathaniel Lauer. Leo, I think that uh, 